Real world assets. Guys, I feel like we feel like it's going to be one of the largest trends, definitely one of the largest narratives here in this next bull market. And I personally think that real world assets is going to bring in the most money, while maybe something like GameFi can help bring in the most users. So in this video, we're going to be covering one of the real world asset protocols that we believe in heavily in Maple Finance. All right, we're going to go through the dots. We're going to go through the tokenomics. We're going to go through how the platform works. We're going to go through the team, literally everything you need to know. And then at the end, we're going to show a yield farming strategy for how you can accumulate Maple Finance passively in a fairly low risk adjusted way, give you the strategy and everything you need. And this is going to be a really good video. JT, how you doing, man? Good, man. And a couple of years ago, there was DeFi summer. This time around, it will be something equivalent to an RWA summer, for sure. For sure. Good point, actually. Yeah, no, but I'm doing good, man. I'm doing great. I'm excited to get into detail on this one. And if you guys notice, each project that we discuss has some type of inherent utility that would attract invest or institutions at the end of the day. Not necessarily because we believe that institutions are what the industry needs to cater to. It's just that when you're talking about volumes of capital, obviously that's where it's going to come from. If you have any hopes of crypto becoming anywhere, and I, I mean the entire market, becoming anywhere near the size of the stock market, for example. And so projects such as these real world assets or some type of utility that will inherently attract institutions that's why it's important to focus on that and at the end of the day long term these are going to be the projects that have some of the biggest long-term gains yep speaking of long-term gains we're also going to do a price prediction in this video as well i don't know if i said that in the intro so before we start two things this video is not financial advice consult with your financial advisor before making any investment decisions and I do have to disclose that I do hold Maple as a part of my institutional portfolio. You ready to get started, bro? Let's do it. All right, let's hop into these docs. All right, so here we are. It says, welcome to Maple. Talks about when they were founded. Talks a little bit about what it is, which we're going to get into right now. And it gives you all the links. Make sure you click in the, the right links and you guys aren't getting scammed. So it says, Maple is an institutional capital network that provides the infrastructure for credit experts to run on-chain lending businesses and it connects institutional lenders to borrowers. So almost like a platform or a middleman for lenders and borrowers amongst institutions. Maple is aiming to transform capital markets by combining industry standard compliance and due diligence with the transparent and frictionless lending enabled by smart contracts and blockchain technology. Now, I think it's important to say that this is <laughs> what they're doing is extremely important because Within DeFi, you hear a lot about over collateralized lending, and that's basically a way to where you have to put up more collateral than you're borrowing. But if we want major institutions to hop on, we're going to need under collateralized lending. Like just think about how impractical it would be or how many people would not have mortgages if they have to put up more than what the house was worth in order to borrow money for the house. So that's super important. 100%, man. Inherently, that does bring more risk. But I know we'll get into the risk at some point here, especially even in the way that the structure is set up. Just through that, in layman's terms, by the way, it's a platform that allows institutional borrowing and lending. And also there's ways to earn yield as well. Uh, but the main aspect of it is borrowing and lending. And who's the target audience? It's institutions, larger funds, that will come in and help facilitate these transactions with borrowers. So this is the lending section here. So like JT said, lending is the easiest way, easiest way to earn money with Maple Finance. This is kind of like yield firming in a way. So lenders deposit money into a pool and they earn interest denominated in the pool's liquidity asset. So if you're lending out ETH, you'll earn ETH. Uh, and this interest is determined by the loan term set by the pool delegate and the borrowers. And we're gonna dive into what a pool delegate is as well. So before lending, lenders will need to prepare the pool denominated asset in their Ethereum wallet and ETH for gas payments. And the cool thing about this platform, and Gavin Wood talks about this with Polkadot a lot, a lot as well, lenders will not need Maple tokens to participate in lending. And this is good because, like I said with Gavin Wood, he's trying to do that same thing with Polkadot and make it so that you can still use like the parachain and everything that they have without needing the actual Polkadot token. 
Because yeah, when the opposite is the case, it feels like a mousetrap a lot of the times. Yeah, not only that, but it's just like it's complicated. Like it's easy to us because we know how to use these wallets and these decentralized exchanges and all this stuff. But when I say decentralized exchange to someone, they're just like, what the hell is that? Yeah. So just being having to go on Coinbase and then having to buy ETH and having to send it somewhere and then use a DEX and then go and use the platform. It's just so many steps, so much red tape in line versus just being able to hop on and use it. So that's really, really important. All right, so now let's hop into these pool of delegates. So what is a pool of delegate? Pool of delegates manage lending pools on Maple. So where people go to borrow, these pool of delegates are the people who are managing them, kind of like a banker when you go borrow money. So Maple provides a decentralized infrastructure, enabling pool of delegates to attract global capital and provide funding to a network of premium borrowers, increasing their potential uh, assets under management while earning performance fees as well. So they're incentivized. So each lending pool is actually managed by a single pool of delegate. That could be a person or an institution. And the pool of delegate is actually responsible for negotiating loan terms with the borrowers. They're responsible for performing the diligence, liquidating the collateral in the event of a default. And they review a borrower's reputation, expertise, and performance to evaluate the terms of the loan. So then once the borrower and the pool of delegate agrees to the interest, collateral ratio, uh, pool of delegates fund the loans from their managed pool. Like I said in the beginning, this is a necessary evolution in crypto because we need under collateralized loans. But in order to successfully have under collateralized loans, because the whole thing with over collateralized loans, it doesn't matter what your credit score is. You don't have to like do any due diligence because you have the money, you have the collateral. If they don't pay the loan back, you can sell it. But on a platform like this, where they're essentially trusting people uh, for their word, they have to do their due diligence and that's kind of what they're talking about here yeah so the delegates will probably 99 percent of the time be more than one person it would be an entity of some sort just because the goal is to attract more capital to their pool which effectively even if it was a singular person let's say elon musk he's a notable figure he's like hey guys i am becoming a delegate on maple finance so please give me your money a lot of people are going to give Elon Musk money, but effectively that turns that pool into a fund. So it's almost like you have a platform made up of different funds. And because of that nature of what it will turn into, naturally, it makes sense that funds out the gate would be the hottest clientele in terms of being a pool delegate. And the pool delegates, one of their jobs, so there isn't some standard across the entire Maple platform that allows for a due diligence standard, I should say. So there isn't some checklist that they provide to these pool delegates. Each pool delegate, they have their own standard at which they carry out due diligence on the people who they're allowing to enter their pool, whether it's somebody they're lending to or one of the investors providing liquidity to them. And so they have their own rules, their own standards to go off of to effectively judge if that person would be a good partner or not. So that is important. And also, once again, that brings on more risk, but also it mitigates risk of default on the blanket side in terms of maple finance. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, so let's move on to the next point. What criteria do pool delegates use to assess people who are borrowing money? Like I said, this is important. So when establishing a lending pool, the pool delegates will be asked to provide lenders with the information on their investment strategy. Like how, how are they gonna use the money? So pool delegates, they can be explicit and define an investment strategy based on region, target borrow industry, credit quality, and more. But after the borrowers submit their uh, request for quote or RFQ for short uh, for a loan on Maple, pool delegates will actually be able to review the RFQs and engage with borrowers that are in line with their lending pool strategy. So they'll assess borrower reputation and request the borrowers to submit financials for a confidential review, unlike everything else that's kind of like public and on chain. Uh, and then this, that info will be used to calibrate interest collateral ratios appropriate to each borrower. So it's not going to be the same yeah. thing to each borrower, just like when you go to get a mortgage at a bank, your interest rate and all the terms of the loan is going to depend on your history, your credit score, et cetera, et cetera. That really hammers on the point that, you know, it'll probably be more funds that are attracted to be pool delegates just because they're asked for their investment strategy. I'm, that's going to be pretty detailed. And I'm sure it's a lot more than that. And so, yeah, like these are guys who who's been carrying out these strategies for you know 10 20 years already sometimes more <laughs> mm -hmm. just now they'll have more flexibility and more tools which is part of the excitement 
Yep. All right, let's move on to the next part. What incentives do pool delegates have to issue loans that perform well? So pool delegates are actually sole providers of what's called first loss capital. And first loss capital means it's just a funding arrangement where a capital provider and a hedge fund manager contribute capital to a managed account. The manager has a trading discretion over the account and bears the first losses from trading. The capital provider usually matches the manager's investment of 10 to 20 percent so if they have an investor invest 100k they'll put 10 to 20k of the total managed account and first loss capital is actually designed to align interest between investors and managers managers receive higher incentive fees in exchange for sharing potential losses with investors but this directly aligns incentives between lenders and delegates so basically yeah. like me i have a hedge fund i would be frowned upon if i didn't have any of my money in it because it's like you build this house, but you don't want to live in it. It's kind of how people would look at it. So this first loss capital makes it so that while you're not required, it's, it's more of like an unwritten rule, at least in the hedge fund industry, while you're not required to put money in there, if you do, it looks better. And the first loss capital makes it so that if there are losses, you're experiencing the losses first. So that way everyone has some skin in the game. So uh, going back to Maple, the amount of first loss capital is actually determined through negotiations with the Maple team, and it'll be reassessed as the pool grows in size. Delegates will have a liquidation maximum per default, and this rate is a percentage of the total first loss capital provided. To so, simplify that even more is basically saying that they need to have a, a minimal number in there so that in the event that there's mass losses, the thing that's going to be depleted first is all the money in that first loss capital account. Yep. Yeah. And then if you want to become a pool delegate, you have to connect with the Maple team. It's not just for anyone. So, you know, while this is crypto, I forget who talked about it. Might have been Brian Armstrong, but you can build centralized protocols on top of decentralized protocols. So like Maple is built on ETH and Base and Solana, but you can't build decentralized protocols on top of centralized protocols so that's important to keep in mind all right so now let's look at their loan types so they have two distinct types they have open term and fixed term so it says open term loans refer to loans that are issued without an explicit maturity date and which must be repaid in a limited time window once the delegate calls the loan and then it says open term loans are also flexible on the borrower side so borrowers can close open term loans without penalty right. and then the fixed term loans uh, refer to loans with an agreed upon due date set at loan creation um, and then fixed term loans provide certainty on both allocators and borrowers and both fixed and open term loans can be re refinanced however the delegate cannot call a fixed term loan since these loans have a specified end date fixed term loans are most useful as maple expands into the rwa space as fixed term lending is a core primitive in traditional finance right so you know this is um at first glance it seems like the open term loans are more attractive than fixed term, but fixed term is what's going to bring the big capital in. Open term loans are more geared towards the smaller investors. And for, let me start here. The way that smaller investors are even able to participate in these loans is because of the way uh, they have these pools of delegates basically embarking on their own KYC mechanisms effectively. And so obviously they have more flexibility in who they bring on uh, versus who they don't. And so that's the main reason as to why retail investors can even participate in this to the tune, you know, five, ten thousand dollars And it doesn't have to be 500000 or 700000 or something crazy. So, yeah, at first glance, you know, it seems like the more attractive option are open term. Um, but that's going to be to your uh, more retail investor. Uh, the institutional side, they're going to be more attracted to the fixed term loans. An example of a fixed term loan, just at its most basic level, guys, if you're not aware already, is a mortgage. Let's say a 30 year fixed mortgage to be specific. And, you know, open term loans, they generally don't have a maturity date. So that could be a form of like a creative finance transaction in real estate, if you guys understand real estate. And just one more thing to add as to why like fixed term loans are more attracted to institutions. Institutions have rigorous protocols that they have to abide by, budgets and things like that. It's not just like one person. It's a daisy chain. Everyone has to kind of like follow commands and things like that. So imagine you take out a loan for $50 million. On an open term loan, it says here, limited time window. It, can, it must be paid in a limited time window once the delegate calls. So like, let's say that time window is a few months from January to June. I'm not sure how long the time limits are. 
if you have a $50 million loan and you're paying that back and your payments are a couple hundred thousand at a time, you know, you don't want to create a situation where you can get called and have to pay a large a amount. Balloon. That would be a balloon payment. Yeah. And have to pay a large amount because that would just go against what you're trying to do as a company. Like it can affect everything else. So and they can call it at any time. So I'm assuming that means, look, Friday at 4.53 p.m. when you bought to go to the Bahamas, they call that loan due. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to access and permission pools. So these permission pools, like they sound, you have to have permission. They're private pools on Maple. So the delegates determine the entry requirements for all the permission pools. And then there are lending vehicles for lenders who need to know that all lenders in the pool are KYC and known actors. So as you'll see on the website, when we go do the walkthrough, there'll be like permission list pools and there'll be permission pools. You want to get access to the mission, to the permission pools. And it's not even necessarily that they have a better APR or not. It's just what the pool delegate describes or prefers. All right. Now let's talk about defaults and impairment. So defaults can be executed by a pool delegate when a borrower has not made a payment, including non-payment or insufficient uh, payment of principal. Like it doesn't matter. Uh, as long as it's past the grace period on the loan, the default will reduce the pool's value uh, by the amount of outstanding principal on the loan and any interest accrued. And they will sell any collateral on the loan and increase the value of the pool to the value of the liquidated collateral. And then third, it'll move delegate first loss capital to the value of the liquidation max per default into the pool. So this is how they ensure that, hey, if things aren't getting paid, they have these three ways to make it so that so I'm almost acting as like it's over collateralized to where you have all the collateral and it sells it and takes a fee and you just keep what you borrow kind of thing. And then they go on to describe the risk. So you have admin control risk. This has to do with the Maple Dow. So, you know, you could have people vote against something that you don't want. You have smart contract risk, which is essentially trust in the code of Maple that's built on top of Ethereum. You have default risk, which is pretty self-explanatory and then risk of loss. So it says holding, lending or borrowing digital assets involves a substantial degree of risk, including a risk of complete loss of these assets, those assets. I don't know if they're referring to the price going down in what you're borrowing or like in that pool. So basically, yeah. So the risk of loss, you risk losing everything in that pool because you're under because of the under collateralization. That's really what introduced that risk to a high degree. In addition, to each pool delegate being able to carry out their own standard for onboarding their clientele. And so just because of those two things, it does introduce that risk to a higher degree, but it wouldn't be existential to the platform. It would just be concentrated to that delegates pool, which is a beautiful thing for the platform. And so in a way, if there is a fund manager or a delegate that comes on board, and they're not the most proficient at carrying out KYC and any necessary diligence to make sure they're lending to the right people where well, they're going to get weeded out fairly quickly. Indubitably. All right. Now let's move on to the withdrawal process. So it says here, all withdrawal requests are grouped into withdrawal cycles, which are clinically occurring periods of time, such as every week. By grouping users into cycles, the delegates ensure that users get a prorated distribution of cash in the event of partial liquidity in the system. So it says during each withdrawal cycle, there's a window of time where all withdrawal requests assigned to it will be eligible for withdrawal. And this window is a period of time that takes place at the start of each withdrawal cycle. During each window, the assets required to satisf satisfy all withdrawals taking place in that window will be locked, not at the disposal of the pool delegate when funding new loans. So the withdrawal process occurs in three steps. First, the user has to submit a, a request to withdraw during the current cycle. They can modify or cancel their request during the stage. Two, they must wait for the following or previous cycle to complete until their request is eligible to be processed. Three, users execute their withdrawal during the eligible withdrawal window. This is essentially just doing it. So that's pretty cut and dry. So like I said earlier, like you can build centralized technology on top of decentralized technology. Um, and normally in crypto and DeFi, like things like Maple, Compound, Uniswap, pretty much anything where you stake your funds to get a yield, it's usually liquid to the point where you can pull it off immediately. But this one, you have to wait 
for cycles, which is kind of like waiting for epochs. Like you see protocols to have epochs right. where you have to wait, but it's not super typical on platforms such as these that's just doing like typical borrowing and lending. But since you have pool delegates and you have people controlling it, it would kind of be like if Ave had some suppliers and borrowers and the suppliers got to pick who borrowed the money instead of Ave facilitating everything. Like since Ave is facilitating everything, it makes sense why everything can be withdrew at any point in time as long as there's enough liquidity. But since they have different parameters and do things a different way, this is just a system that works best for them. Yeah, it's almost like a way to um, basically just mitigate a walk or a run on the on a bank. All right, let's move on to the cash management pool. So this is specifically designed as an on-chain cash management solution. And I kind of look at this as having like on-chain treasuries and you got you guys will see why in a second here. So it says, the cash management pool provides a simple and fast access to yield source from U.S. Treasury bills and meets the liquidity risk and accounting requirements of lenders. So basically, so if you look at the features, you get fast access to yield source from U.S. Treasury bills. And it talks about everything you need to know in regards to managing withdrawals, monitoring the performance. It also talks about reverse uh, repurchase agreements, by the way, under that. So basically, so it's backed by bills, uh, T-bills. Uh, it's just in the same paragraph. It's so it's backed by T bills and RPs, which is the reverse repo facility. But the, in this case, is backed by the agreements of the actions that take place in the reverse repo facility. And I think it's important to state they're not buying these or tokenizing these bonds or RP agreements. They actually are pledged by different investors who actually already hold them. So that's important to distinguish. And it might be important to actually break down what the repurse, uh, reverse repurchase facility is. And so it's important to understand what the repo facility is. So repo is short for repurchase. So when you look at the repo facility, it's effectively allowing banks and institutions to sell assets, treasuries to the Federal Reserve in exchange for dollars for liquidity on their balance sheet. And it's usually short term. So let's say it's one day and they're gonna rebuy that back tomorrow or maybe three months from now even. A reverse repo facility is literally the opposite. The Federal Reserve will go ahead and say, hey guys, we're holding a lot of treasuries here. How about I sell you some treasuries? You give me that excess liquidity that you have and then we'll buy them back from you later. And so that's, that's effectively what it is. And so Maple Finance is using the yield that's attached to those overnight loans between the Federal Reserve and banks, as well as T-bills and bills are a year and less, they're short-term treasuries. So they're taking those yields, so four or 5% yields, and that's how these investors are generating the yield through these risk-free assets on the Maple platform. Very good explanation. All right, so now let's go over. So we're still within the cash management pool. Let's look at uh, lending, withdrawing, and risk. All right, so it says, what assets do the, does the borrower invest in? So it says, the borrowers are only permitted to invest proceeds in U.S. Treasury bills and reverse repurchase agreements fully collateralized by T-bills. U.S. Treasury bills are backed by the full faith of the government, obviously, and they're considered one of the safest forms of debt around. And so that no one has fear or anything of like using this, there are no other permitted use of the proceeds other than to invest into the treasury. No, they're really focused on a risk-free rate. And so I like the fact that they're, what, once again, just bringing more focus on a risk-free rate into the crypto space. Uh, because I remember asking you guys a long time ago, what is the risk-free rate in crypto? And I couldn't pinpoint it. But now that we have products such as these, well, now we do have a risk-free rate. So I think I think that's fantastic that they're only allowing collateralization only with treasuries and RRPs. Yeah, and when he says risk-free rate, it's basically uh, a yield you can get with the least amount of risk, and that's mm -hmm. treasury bonds because it's essentially the U.S. dollar's debt and the United States dollar's is the strongest currency, so it's risk-free. Right. So yeah, they give you all the details on that and I'll let you guys go through all that. We're just giving you guys the high level and trying to keep this video, you know, somewhat short. We know it's going to be long already. And it also gives you the risk. You have impairment risk, counterparty risk, contagion risk, smart contract risk, risk of 
USDC breaking the peg, which has happened once, and then risk of loss again. Hey, hey, you know, they did a good job, once again, is getting as close to risk-free as, as possible by only allowing U.S. Treasury bills. Remember, short-term, guys, less than a year, bills and RRPs. So they did a good job at mitigating risk of loss. You know, counterparty risk, that's one thing. The risk of USDC breaking that peg, that's another thing. And contagion risk is also always a risk, especially when you're dealing with individualized pools on one even decentralized platform. Last point, the thing that mitigates that, just like any other protocol in the crypto space, is just having more TVL, which over time increases the security, which mitigates any possibility uh, that any of these risks actually come to reality. Yep. And also having smart contract insurance so that if something happens, you know, you can get paid out, but you just have to keep in mind that you do have to pay for that insurance. And if it doesn't happen, then you just pay it for nothing but peace of mind. All right, let's move on to uh, Maple for borrowers. So new borrowers on Maple need to create an account and go through the approval process, just like lenders do as well. Uh, once a borrower is approved on a platform, they're able to submit loan requests in pools. So basically apply for a loan. So before approving, delegates conduct uh, financial due diligence on the borrower and agree to the terms with the borrower off chain, guys. This is Big to remember, I keep saying you can build centralized things on top of decentralized things. So they're, they have to agree off chain and they have to sign term sheets and everything that you assign at a bank. So then borrowers submit a new loan request on chain that's viewable by pool delegates. Once the new loan uh, request is submitted on chain, it can't be altered in any way. If there is an error, a new loan request would actually need to be created. And then once the due diligence is completed, terms are agreed to. The on-chain loan request is submitted. The pool delegate funds the loan by making the funds requested available for drawdown by the borrower. It's at this point that the loan's finalized, the repayment schedule commences. Borrowers will return to the web app to make their interest repayments on a recurring basis and view details of their loan on the Maple platform. And then it kind of shows you like the steps, which is pretty self-explanatory. So now let's talk about uh, loan management. So they're talking about how they're trying to make it as easy as possible to manage your loans. So it's three essential actions, creating a loan, self-explanatory, making a payment, self-explanatory, and refinancing the loan. I just want to talk about the refinancing piece. So basically, uh, loans can be refinanced while the loan is outstanding, not when it's called upon, uh, provided by both the delegate and the borrower agree to the refinance terms. And normally this would occur after negotiating these terms with a delegate and signing the amendment to the loan terms. Uh, the refinancing allows the borrower to update loan terms such as interest rate, principal, and delegate origination and admin fees. The interest rate that exists inside of the platform, obviously it's backed by that interest rate on treasury bills, as well as that RRP overnight rate or so far, which means the benchmark is also the Fed funds rate. And so you could, use monetary policy in a way to help determine how you invest on this platform because monetary Ooh, policy that's an alpha right there yeah no for sure uh monetary policy is definitely going to affect how money flows through here so that's good stuff right there man that's real good stuff all right so let's go through like the maple token we're going to go through the actual tokenomics a little bit later in the video but just wanted to cover this. So Maple is the governance token of the Maple protocol. Governance means you hold the token and if you stake it, you get to, you know, vote on certain protocol actions. And like it says here, participate in governance and more importantly, earn fees. All right. So now it says, you, you know, you get to stake it and earn fees. Where are those fees coming from? So it says the Maple Treasury earns a portion of the fees generated by the Maple protocol. For the full scope of fees, you get to view the section here, but basically you'll be able to vote on the use of fees earned by the treasury. And the main options are buying back maple to be held in the treasury. When you buy back a token, it makes the price go up just because supply and demand. Distribute fees to the maple DAO to continue funding operations and growth, and then distributing fees to maple holders. Another important thing, security and crypto, well, really anywhere, when it comes to like allowing your funds access to another protocol you want to make sure that security is of the utmost taken care of i guess so maple did have all of their smart contracts audit and i'll leave you guys to go through it but basically what's important is that they get an audit and then they have vulnerabilities you know audits normally don't come back clean the first time that's why it's good to get multiple audits 
you want to see the things that were addressed on the last audit taken care of on the one that came after. And, you know, whenever you see a protocol getting multiple audits, I take it as them being serious. These audits are not cheap. So to get multiple audits, you're spending money before you're actually like making revenue. So it shows that they kind of believe in it. They also have a bug bounty to where they will pay you based on how urgent the problem is or the vulnerability is that you identify or find. They'll pay you to fix it and notify them. Also shows that they're serious about the protocol as well. Yeah, even if they have a bunch of BS going on with their platform that's found out through an audit, the fact that they went through that much scrutiny and say they go through one more audit and we notice even a tenth of those problems were fixed, well, at least you can have some faith that once again, that they're serious. <laughs> all right, so now that we went through all the docs, guys, let's start to look at some of uh, Maple Finance's metrics and how they kind of stack up to their competitors. So if you go to DeFi Llama and you click RWA, which stands for Real World Assets, obviously you scroll down and you can kind of see everyone that's in this category. You see a lot of red here. And you can see that Maple is number 10. It says they have a TVL of 36 million. There's been a decrease in the past month, week, and day, but that is with all the other protocols as well, pretty much. And then if you click on it, it gives you the USD inflows, which looks like it's been kind of increasing, but kind of leveling off as of lately. So you got the TVL, which is the orange line, which grew exponentially pretty much last year and kind of falling off, but we'll see how it holds up. And then you can see that people are tweeting about it a lot. It's always interesting seeing that the tweet, the blue line. I feel like if you went through every RWA product, it will look pretty much like this. Mm -hmm. so you would see a, a lot of upticks in that 2022 year. Obviously, things were pretty quiet up until towards the end where we started getting more ETF approval talks. I like to use this one as well because it, you know, there are different categories within real world assets, just like it's different categories within finance. You have derivatives, trading, borrowing and lending, et cetera. So you go to rwa.xyz and you click private credit, you can see that Maple's number two, right? They have 1.8 billion that they've done so far in total loans. They have 144 million right now in active loans with the average uh, base APY of 8.6%. That is, you know, a couple of multiples higher than inflation. And that's extremely important if you're entering into a stablecoin pool. So, and guys, as the time go on, we're going to research all these protocols and give you like the best video on all the ones we feel like are important that we're adding to our portfolio. You have this cash drag feature here, and this is basically the percentage of idle capital in the pool, aka money not being used. And this is a big reason why Uniswap launched UniV3, concentrate liquidity, because the old way it was sometimes the capital was idle and it wasn't getting used. You just have it staking on there, not doing anything. Maple is using 100% of all the capital on the platform. More than Centrifuge, which is number one, and more than all these other protocols, Credit's negative 25. I'm wondering if how that works, but yeah, interesting stuff. Now that we've covered all that stuff, let's do the platform walkthrough. And then after we go through this, we're gonna do the price prediction, show you the yield farming strategy, et cetera, et cetera. So here we are on maple.finance. You see there on these three chains here, total loans issue and deposits, they pretty much you know, talk about the things we talked about in the docs. All right, so let's hit uh, launch app. Guys, so we are, you always hear us talk about like us having ambivalence towards investing into anonymous founders. And these founders are all pretty docs and they have a pretty strong team. It's also important that they know what they're talking about, man. So if they have any interviews out there and you're considering investing in the platform, it might be worth it to go watch, listen to how they speak about the platform, listen to how they speak about the ethos that the platform is surrounded around you know it's funny i was watching uh a cnbc interview one time it was when they had like it was like a, what was it like an ai box thing and they had the ceo on cnbc humana was the company name and uh they had the ceo on cnbc and they asked him all these questions about you know like why would people use this like what does it do and Basically, it was the biggest fail I've ever seen in any interview ever when it came to talking about your own product. He couldn't answer a single question. It kind of felt like he was getting clowned on CNBC. I'm like, damn, you get clowned on CNBC. That's horrible. Like, they're professionals, bro. 
they they clowning you right now. All of these guys, like they, they, the team was displayed in a different way. You can just click the link in LinkedIn and stuff. But this guy came from a banking background where he, I think he worked in the risk department. Correct me if I'm wrong. Their whole, their whole team is, they, they have good experience that directly translates to Maple Finance, which is good. And yeah. these are the members, and I'll leave you guys to like go and do the research. I already did. I was planning on clicking it and bringing it straight to LinkedIn, but like I said, it's not displaying how it did even five minutes ago. Let's uh, talk about some of these pools. So you have your cash management pools, the secured by treasury bills, liquidity, three hours. You click on it, it shows the strategy and pretty much all the metrics that you need. You can download the performance. That's really cool. It shows the pool strategy. It shows the borrowers, like literally everything you need to know, the pool details, the pool stats, APY since inception and the trail and 30 day APY. So that's pretty cool. And if you want to, you have to create a profile with Maple as well. I don't know if this is a permission pool or a permission list pool. You have over collateralized lending, which is kind of just like being on Aave. I wouldn't imagine that this one is permissioned because, you know, that's something simple you can get anywhere. Gives you the strategy, pretty much all the documentation. It gives you the collateral breakdown. These are some of the best metrics I've seen that they give on any DeFi project that I've ever looked at, to be honest. Hey, I want to ask you a question, man. So do you know what happens if, are you able to lock in this 4.83% uh, yield? I, I don't know if they mentioned that or not. And I didn't see anything about that. So if you have, if you initiated a transaction as a counterparty and the yield changes on the 10 year, for example, or I'm sorry, on uh, let's say five months, for example, if the yield changes, does your yield change within that transaction that is taking place or are you able to lock in that yield uh in the event that yields go lower mm. and then what happens because it's backed by u.s treasury bills what happens once again when if yields go higher and the value of those bonds go lower how does that affect the protocol oh i wish we had the ceo on here yeah to be honest I'd imagine that it would affect it and how though the yield will change. And that I feel like that's why they show like the 30 day performance. Like they show all the stuff on performance mm -hmm. because it's just like, they can't give you a yield that they're not getting in my mind. And I guess, you know, because this under collateralized, I guess it allows for the value fluctuations on uh, those T bills and it wouldn't directly affect the holders, borrowers or lenders. Yeah, that seems like that makes sense. Huh. Yeah. Well, if you're watching this, Sydney, please answer that question for us, brother. Dude, watch the vid. It's like, no. Big Sid, come on and buy a pie. We can shoot a vid, vid. Ooh, let's go. All right, let's move on to. Guys, if you haven't realized, I used to be a rapper. It's like, no, baby. It used to be because it didn't work out. And now he's a podcaster. Nah, so it worked out. I just like more one. Oh, yeah, it didn't work out yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so now you have uh their corporate credit and it shows opportunistic high yield let's click on this one so with corporate credit i mean it's it's kind of a market where they can invest in a myriad of securities so it could be t-bills it could be commercial paper it could be corporate bonds it could be government bonds as well in addition to t-bills it could be funds in the rrp as well you can invest in a myriad of things in the corporate credit market and it's been growing because it's cutting out the middleman in a way you're going more direct to each counterparty and rick reader talks about the corporate credit markets a lot he's with uh, blackrock and uh, i believe he's the head of fixed income strategy for them but anyway so this is like his thing and uh the corporate credit market has been growing heavily especially when we have entered a time and with tight monetary policy like we've had over the past uh 18 months or so Obviously, we're going to be looser, but still, relatively speaking, over the last decade or so, we're still going to be tighter. And so the corporate credit market is going to continue to grow from here. All right. So, so this this one is actually managed by uh, Maple's in-house team. And it, it says that here. It also says uh, the yields are not guaranteed. So I'd imagine that that's the case for all the other ones, because that would subject themselves to like a lot of. Come on, this is still the opportunistic pool, the high yield pool. Yep. OK, yeah. Yeah, no, 100%. That's part of the game. When anytime you hear commercial paper, just know that 
there's an opportunity for a chance that junk bond, I didn't even mention that the first time, junk bonds is also a part of that, which has a high risk of default, which is part of the reason you're getting this higher yield. Yep. And so when they say opportunistic, you can replace that word with risky and it means the same thing. Or bullshit. It's like, no, I'm just no. <laughs> All right. And then they have their uh, real world asset pools as well. And this one is catered to companies who have treasuries made up of stable coins designed to prioritize capital preservation. So it sounds like they're just trying to get a yield over inflation so that their cash isn't just eroding away. And again, it gives you all the details. You can download the deck. Like, man, the, the data that they provide is pretty uh, spectacular, I will say. So now let's look at X Maple, and this is kind of just like Pendle or Curve. Like you get. Yeah, this is what you get when you get when you stake your Maple. This is what you get. Exactly. So you stake it, and then that's how you get access to the fees and being able to, like, vote and all that stuff. They give you the directions on all of that. This is where you have to apply to become a pool delegate. And that is pretty much the platform walkthrough. Let's dive into the tokenomics. This is the price prediction right here. I can fly like a bird. No, 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 no. It's like, no. Right now, you can see that the market cap is under 100 million. It's 98.5 million, right? And you have a fully diluted valuation of 125 million, which means that there's roughly $27 million worth of tokens that still has to come onto the market. Looks like it's around 10 to 20% or so that still has to come onto the market. And if you hover over this, it shows you where all the tokens are because from all the information that I did, it looks like they're all unlocked. It shows the token allocation. So the team and the advisors got 25%. I don't particularly like that. That is a lot, but it's not extremely bad. I've seen better projects where the team got more. You had the treasury, they got 14%. And this is how they're like able to incentivize people, pay out fees, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with liquidity mining, public auction, 5%, which is actually really small. And then the seed investors got 26%. And then you can see like the linear vesting here and the supply curve. So it looks like all the tokens got unlocked in March of this year is what this chart is showing here because it's, it's a max supply of 10 million tokens. So for the price prediction, if you look here, you click market clap, you click, you click max, you can see that in the last bull market or last time they reached all time highs. We're not going to say bull market because it was not a bull market in April of 2022. They reached a little bit over 300 million. Now, given that I feel like real world assets is going to be a huge narrative. You see that Maple Finance is number two when it comes to private institutional credit. And you, you see how legit the platform is, the team is, and all that stuff. I think at a minimum that this can reach a $10 billion market cap and be in the top 30, maybe even top 20, maybe even top 10. Minimum $10 billion market cap. And I think maximum it can reach a $25 billion market cap. But I always like to play conservative. So in order for it to reach that, that means that it will have to do a 101x from current prices. And that will bring the current price to $1,268.56. All right. Now, I am going to make a, a video showing a take profit strategy for Maple so you can maximize the profits. So if you want to get access to that video, subscribe to my channel uh, at Crypto Noah, my personal channel. That's where I'm going to put that one out. And then also, guys, if you like this content that we're putting out and you want to learn how to yield farm like a professional and generate passive income on high quality assets ahead of the next bull market, head over to knowitals.xyz or you can just click the link in the description and book a free strategy session with our team. We have a course that literally covers everything you need to know regarding mindset, chart mastery so you can master your entries and your exits, Web3 and DeFi fundamentals so you know how Web2 and Web3 are going to connect and pretty much interact security practices so you don't get hacked intro to yield farming and then advanced yield farming that and it literally covers everything you need to know no matter what your risk appetite or tolerance is no matter what your personality type is or personality type is once you go through the course you get access to our coaches uh me and jt included there's me there's jt and we're going to be doing live strategy calls, Q and A's, answering your questions, showing you our strategies, you know, just giving you alpha. So if that sounds like a good fit for you and you want to be a part of a mastermind of like-minded people who are hungry for knowledge, 
want to create wealth amongst the largest transfer of wealth that is upon us right now. Like I said, click the link in the description. We, we look forward to meeting you. So now that we went through the price prediction, let's show you guys a yield farming strategy for you, how you can accumulate maple at a rapid clip at a fairly low risk way so that once the bull market comes and you have your price targets and you're ready to sell, you'll have more to sell. All right. So here is my analysis of maple now or in the short term. So if you've watched our other videos, you know what our stance on the market is. We feel like there's going to be one more major correction. So I think we'll see Maple come back down to our 200 day moving average, which is where this green line is. And I think we'll consolidate within this range for a few months. So I want to provide liquidity within this range. And I actually am. So before you even go to start providing liquidity, this is what you want to look at. You go to CoinGecko and you scroll down at the bottom and you can see it gives you the percentages of where most of the trading volume is happening. These are all centralized exchanges, these top ones, but it then it says Uniswap V3 and then Balancer. You click on it. I click Balancer. It brought me to this and I typed in Maple and I only get this pool that shows these four assets. I don't know what these are. I don't want to get in this pool. So you have to keep that in mind. Sometimes these things are outdated. So what I like to do is I come to Uniswap, you click top pools, you search maple, and you can see the top pools. Now, in our mastermind, we teach you to look for pools with high volume to TVL ratios, which means that you want the volume as close to or higher than the TVL as possible. So these are the top two pools, Maple ETH and Maple USDC. So these would be two pools that I'd be interested in doing. So now that I know what I what pairs I want to provide liquidity in, I already did my price analysis on this. But I also like to look at ratios so i couldn't pull up maple eth on trading view so here i am on deck screener so ratios are important because you want to keep your risk management in mind like a lot of times or most of the time it's not the importance of just investing you want to have a structure around your investment because you can buy a 100x altcoin and not take any profit if you don't have the correct structure around it so i think eth is going to three to five x in the next bull market and I think maple is going to 100x in the next bull market so that means I think that maple is going to outperform eth so you can have some of it set aside to where maybe you just have like a standard limit order because we don't know how fast maple is going to accelerate and you don't want to have impermanent loss and put all of your funds into a yield farming pool just to make a high yield but some of it you can put in and you can pair it with eth and you do this because you want to I want to take some profits in eth because I know that whenever the market drops maple is going to drop way more than ETH, I can guarantee it in this bull market, I can guarantee it. So I'm looking at this range because for the same reason, I think that in the short term, we're gonna see a dip in the markets and I think that Maple is going to dip more than ETH and it can be an opportunity for us to take our ETH and cycle into Maple as it gets to this level, all right? So now that we know the ranges we wanna provide liquidity in, let's look at how much yield we could have made had we provide liquidity within the range of $9.63 at the bottom and $18.55 at the top from the last 60 days in the ETH USDC pool on Uniswap that I just showed you. Go over to Builder Metrics. I made a video on this. I already inputted all the data. I already inputted the price. I put 60 days and I also made a video on Yielder. So if you want to 3x your fees or 5x, I don't know if they change it, but you can increase your fees up to 5x, but you also have to remember that increases your risk 5x as well. So if you look at this, you could have been getting 21% per month for the past 60 days with a yearly yield of 262% APR. So if you deposited $1,000, you could have made $383 USDC and $616 in Maple. Just to put that in perspective, man, so if you got 100,000, Whatever this total number is, 383 plus uh, 616, that's $900. So an extra $90,000 in 60 days from this strategy with a 100 grand base. So I want to throw that in perspective just because, of course, with a 1,000, it doesn't seem like that much for some reason. Exactly. And then it gives you like the risk level. It gives you the volume to TVL ratio, which is pretty good here, the volatility, the current TVL. So now that was the maple usdc pool how much could you have made in the past 60 days if you paired maple with eth in the pool that we showed on uniswap and all you have to do is copy and paste these ranges and you have to make sure it's toggled within the right one and the reason guys he's monitoring ranges on his technicals right now is because when he starts to provide liquidity it's concentrated liquidity and it's going to be within this range and if it's not then his funds would be sitting there doing nothing anyway 
um, which he would risk in permanent uh, loss or slippage. Exactly. And guys, it may be confusing when you go to paste like the numbers on builder metrics, but you just want to make sure that you're showing the price in wrapped ETH. You see how you have these few zeros here. If I show the price in USDC, it'll give an actual price and you won't be able to input that into builder metrics. So just be sure you click ETH. And then if it's showing backwards, you just hit toggle pair. So had you been in a maple ETH pool for the past 60 days with a thousand dollars, you could have been getting an APR of 308% or 25% per month with a $1,000 deposit. And guys, this is free money. This is free money. $1,000 deposit, you could have made $491 in ETH and $508 in Maple. Guys, that is absolutely excellent. And this is why we talk about yield farming being the best opportunity to generate passive income in the history of mankind. As long as you know what you're doing. And here at Know-It-Owls, we make sure you know what you're doing, guys. So if you like this kind of content, I'm telling you guys to tap in. This is two months, by the way. I just always, perspective is important, man. You know, two months from now, guys. An extra $900 will do most people pretty good. Let's say you have an extra $900 or whatever, and now you get 100x on $900. That's way more money, guys. Like you got to think about it with your take profit strategy, like mixing yield farming and trading. It's just yield farming just offers you another tool on your tool belt that you wouldn't have without it. Like you've hey, never been able to do something like this. One thing I would add real quick you said passive. I agree with you, but I will always be a stickler when people say passive, because at the end of the day, guys, it requires still a lot of work. It passive requires your, active management. Right. A hundred percent. So passive in the term that it's not a job, you know, but at the same time, and it's usually an extra source of income for most people. But yes, this stuff requires it requires work at the end of the day. I always feel some type of way about passive, but I, I am in also agreeing with you that this is one of the best passive passive i'm using air quotes income opportunities out there right now in any type of market whether it's a bearable market or a consolidated market absolutely a yeah. consolidated market would be the best because consolidation you get in small ranges of volatility and they become predictable over you know a week span of time or so and you can make some pretty great uh trades happen within that time yeah there are good yield farming strategies for bull markets bear markets and crab markets which are sideways markets and we teach you how to do all of them Mm -hmm. So, guys, with that, we like to conclude this video. If you got value from this video, we ask that you consider subscribing to Know It Owls, also our personal channels, Jay Mansion and Crypto Noah. Like, comment, share with a friend. Let us know what real world asset protocol you want us to cover next. And with that, we'll see y'all in the next video. Thanks for watching. Next week, we have Jamie Diamond coming on. No, I'm playing. I wish. See you on the next <laughs> one. <laughs>